We are a Bible-believing church, and therefore, it's important to have a Bible in front of you. If you, um, if you have a Bible, please go to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, we have provided Bibles in the pews in front of you. Grab one of those Bibles, and if you don't own a Bible, you're welcome to take that one home with you. We are in the eighth of our Ten Commandments series. The Eighth Commandment being, thou shalt not steal, and even if you don't have a Bible and take one of ours, it's not stealing, because you have my permission. You're already learning about the Eighth Commandment. So good morning, my name is Jamie, and I'm happy to be with you today, and honored that you would give me another, another week to be with you in God's Word and to walk us through the Ten Commandments. So if you are in Exodus chapter 20, what we'll do is we'll read verse 1 down to 17, that's all of the Ten Commandments. And we will ask for the Lord's help on our time together. Ten Commandments are found on page 61 of the Church Bible. We'll read all of the Ten Commandments, and then I'll pray and ask for the Lord's help on our time together. And then we will get to work on the Eighth Commandment. We'll spend about 45 minutes working through the Eighth Commandment, which is two words in Hebrew. Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1, this now is the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Would you pray with me? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Father, revive our souls, make us wise. Rejoice our hearts and enlighten our eyes. We ask this in Jesus' name. God's people said amen. Well, some thieves are smarter than other thieves. In 2010, a man named Albert Bailey, hoping to speed up the process of his bank robbery, called the bank beforehand to tell them he was coming. 
so they would be ready. And it did not work out well for him. In 2008, Rupert, Rupert, Ruben Zerati decided that he would rob a muffler shop in Chicago. When he got there, he was told that all the money was kept in a safe and that only the owner knew the combination to the safe, but the owner wasn't due in for a couple of hours. And so Reuben left them his phone number, told them to call him when the owner came in, which they did. And Reuben came, and he met the manager, along with a couple of police officers. But long before these two fellas, there was a man named Jacob who stole what was already his. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married his wife, Rebekah. And they struggled to get pregnant, and Isaac prayed for his wife, and the Lord opened her womb, and she conceived. Twin boys who fought in her womb. And the Lord spoke to Rebekah and said, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. Esau was born first. When the boys grew older, Jacob, the younger, cheated his older brother, lied to his father, and stole the inheritance of the firstborn. But God had already promised that the older would serve the younger. You see, Jacob stole what was already his. And so Jacob uniquely helps us understand the silliness of breaking the Eighth Commandment. What if this very evening, while you are sitting around at home, the Lord Jesus Christ appears in your home? And he speaks directly to you and says, I don't want you to worry about anything. No matter what you need for every day, the rest of your life, I will meet that need. How might that change the way you live? How might that change the way you look at need in your life? Well, the risen Lord Jesus Christ is not likely to do that to you tonight. Know how I know? Because He already has. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God has unlimited riches for everything that you need in Christ Jesus. So dear Christian, Christ is everything and you have Christ, therefore you have everything. There is nothing you need that you don't already possess in Jesus Christ, nothing. And so what does that, what does that mean for stealing? It means that stealing is silliness. It means that stealing is unbelief in the faithfulness of God to keep His Word and provide for His people. It takes from others what God has provided to them. It fails to love your neighbor, and furthermore, it neglects to work for your neighbor's good. That's what stealing is. So here's the big idea this morning. Christ is all, and Christ is yours. So be content with what you have. Work honestly, and don't steal. Three mental handles as we work our way through the Eighth Commandment to help you know where we are and when we'll be done. The Eighth Commandment explained... And then we'll look at the Eighth Commandment broken, and then finally the Eighth Commandment fulfilled. 
So let's take a few minutes and dig into the Eighth Commandment to find out what the Bible teaches about stealing. Let's look one more time. The Eighth Commandment. Very simple. You shall not steal. To steal, as I've already mentioned, means to take what belongs to another without consent. My first memory of breaking the Eighth Commandment, I must have been six or seven years old, and I stole a candy bar from a grocery store and got caught. My Aunt Terry, who was watching me at the time, caught me, and she forced me to tell the clerk at the grocery store and to put the candy bar back. And then when I got home, she spanked my rear. I mean, some of y'all want to spank your own kids. My aunt spanked her sister's kids. It was the Wild West back then. So stealing a candy bar from a grocery store without paying for it, this is breaking the Eighth Commandment. But the Eighth Commandment is more than just taking something that you don't pay for. Remember I told you that the commandments of God, they, the, eight, the Ten Commandments, they always have a negative and a, and a positive. The flip side of the Eighth Commandment, the positive side of the Eighth Commandment is that it protects the rights to personal property. The Eighth Commandment protects the rights to personal property. And as with everything, it starts with God. For the Bible teaches that God is the creator of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. He made the world and everything in the world. That everything in heaven and on earth was made by Him and it belongs to Him. Deuteronomy 10.14 says, To the Lord your God belong heaven and the heavens of heaven, the earth and all that is in it. You see, God cannot break the Eighth Commandment because everything already belongs to Him. He can't steal. God is the provider, and God gives to man what is his, his property. God gives to man the right to duly retain what is rightfully his. You shall not steal presumes that God gives some things to one person and other things to another person. The Eighth Commandment says to us, Be content with what God has given to you and don't take what belongs to another without his or her consent. Additionally, the Eighth Commandment requires us to do whatever we can to protect what belongs to our neighbor and to deal honestly with them and to deal fairly with them. So the Eighth Commandment calls us to work for our neighbor's well-being, their physical well-being, their economic well-being. Now, I've told you before that every every one of the Ten Commandments is like a filing cabinet that many other commandments go in. And into the Eighth Commandment file cabinet, there are many laws, including stealing physical things and stealing non-physical things, so stealing material things and immaterial things, tangible things and intangible things. So we'll start with looking at what the Bible teaches about stealing physical things, and then we'll move on to non-physical forms of stealing. So the Bible teaches that stealing candy bars is breaking the Eighth Commandment, but it's also receiving stolen goods, which breaks the Eighth Commandment. And the penalty for breaking the Eighth Commandment depends upon what you steal. So if you have your Bible open to Exodus 20, go to Exodus chapter 22. Exodus 22, which probably is a page or two in your Bible. And let's look at verse 1. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it, or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Now skip down to verse 5. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over or lets his beast loose and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and is in his own vineyard. You see, 
the restitution is based upon what is stolen. If you steal an ox, it's five oxen to the victim. But if you turn your cattle loose in your neighbor's field, whatever they eat, you have to pay back with the best of your own field. It's these chapters where you get this phrase, an eye for an eye, which Mahatma Gandhi famously disliked because he thought that it, may, it would make the whole world blind. But Mahatma Gandhi was probably a very nice guy, but he's also very dumb. He didn't understand what the Bible actually teaches. An eye for an eye is not a, a guarantee upon revenge. It's actually a limiter on revenge. An eye for an eye means that you can't, like if your neighbor breaks a window in your home, you can't burn his house to the ground. An eye for an eye, it's a limiter. Some forms of stealing are much more serious than others. Go back to chapter 21 and have a look at verse 16. Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. And so the eighth commandment forbids kidnapping, man stealing, human trafficking. Chattel slavery breaks the Eighth Commandment and carries the death penalty. Additionally, the Eighth Commandment forbade the removing of boundary markers to enlarge your own territory and to diminish your neighbor's territory. So you can't can't build a fence through your neighbor's property and didn't claim sovereignty over your side. His property was given to him by God, and we are to accept what God has given to him, accept what God has given to us, and be thankful. The Eighth Commandment also included laws about fraudulent dealings or false weights and measures. So this is Proverbs chapter 20, verse 10. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it. You can see it on the screen above me. Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. The Eighth Commandment forbids extortion, charging excessive interest. And this would include the depreciation of property value to gain an advantage. It would include overcharging for goods and services. Like, you have the right to sell goods and services at whatever price you decide, and you have the right to purchase goods and services at whatever price you decide. You do not have the right to take advantage of someone. So the same chapter, Proverbs 20, verse 14 says, bad, bad, says the buyer. But when he goes away, then he boasts. I'm going to step on some toes for a second. Brothers and sisters, gaining financial advantage from someone's hardship or ignorance is stealing. You turn up at a garage sale and you see something worth hundreds of dollars being sold for $10 and you know it's worth hundreds of dollars. And you don't say something, that's stealing. You don't have to agree with me. You can be wrong. That's fine with me. You're not protecting your neighbor's economic interest. Now, if they know it's worth hundreds of dollars and they choose to sell it for $10, then that's fine. That's their decision. But if you know that thing is worth hundreds of dollars and you buy it for $10 and you don't say anything to them, you are stealing because you're not protecting their economic interests. Taking advantage of loopholes due to oversight or negligence is stealing. It's not good business. It's breaking the Eighth Commandment. When I was in college, a friend and I, we somehow came across bags of those silver coins with the grooves in them that they used to use at like Dave and Buster's or something. I don't even remember how we got hold of these bags, but we figured out that those same coins could be used 
to purchase a bucket of golf balls at our local driving range. All summer long, we were stealing. We were stealing from that. That's probably why I'm so terrible at golf to this very day. (laughs) Taking advantage of loopholes is stealing. Since your toes are already sore, we might as well keep going. Sharing a Netflix password is stealing. There I said it. I mean, Netflix is what, like $10 a month, something like that? Y'all spend that much on coffee at Starbucks. I mean, you can justify it all you want, but according to their terms and conditions for their service, if it's not in your same household, it's stealing. I got more. This is real fun. We can just keep on going. (laughs) Shall we talk about time? Anyone want to talk about stealing time? If you're getting paid to do a service at work, and you're not doing that service, I just don't know any other word except stealing. I understand that there are situations where you might be salaried or you you do services for someone, I understand that this can get a little complicated, but I keep seeing these videos. After 2020, we have a lot of folks working from home, and I keep seeing these videos of software that people run that make them appear on their computer to be actually active. When they're not active, they're out off doing something else, probably hitting stolen golf balls at their driving range. I just don't know what else to call that except stealing. Maybe it isn't stealing. Here's what I might suggest to you if that's the case in your life. Ask your boss. Maybe your boss doesn't care if you spend three hours a day on TikTok. I don't know. But you should ask. For the sake of your own soul, you should ask. Christian, you carry the name of Christ. Just because everyone at work steals from work changes nothing with you and God. Now, the the flip side of this coin, stolen silver coin, the flip side of this coin is not paying your employees what they're due. That's also a form of stealing. The Apostle James, which I love James, he lays the smack down on some folks who are not paying their people. In yesterday's Bible reading plan, this is James chapter 5, I think you have the slide up here. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of angel armies, which is what the Lord of hosts means. So if you're a boss, you pay your employees what they're worth. And if you're a Christian boss, I don't know, if you can afford it, it just seems to me you should pay well. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans 13. Pay to all what is owed to them. And then he gives some examples. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. I'd love to get into that, but I don't want everyone to hate me, so I'll just leave that alone. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. And then notice how he flips to the non-physical things. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. To refuse to give honor to whom it is owed is stealing. Accepting credit for something that someone else did is stealing. The Bible said Absalom stole the heart of Israel from his father, David. So give credit where credit is due. You know, we steal credit. We steal glory from God for taking credit for things that he does. The Bible says that salvation is from the Lord. That there is salvation in no one but Him. 
So to claim that we've contributed something to our salvation is stealing glory from the one who planned it and pulled it off. Some would say that, you know, God, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection on the cross, made salvation possible, but I make salvation effective through my faith, through my believing in Him. It doesn't the Bible actually teach that faith itself is a gift? And doesn't Romans 1 and Romans 16 teach that God brings about the obedience to the faith? God brings it about. This is Titus 3 verse 5. He saved us. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. So what part do we play in our salvation? The part that made salvation necessary. The part that put Jesus on the cross. So here's what I know. In a hundred billion years from now, when we are walking those streets of gold, there won't be any one of us humming hymns to our own good decision making. But every one of us will be soaring with praise, blasting the words of Romans 11.36. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. So faith is a gift. God deserves the credit. Salvation is a gift. God deserves the credit. It's everything. I mean, it's going to be Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks. And I, I was listening this morning. If you, if you could go back in your brain and listen to some of the prayers already, Corey's prayer, Steve's prayer, Matt's prayer, there was a lot of thanksgiving in those prayers. And I don't know if you've noticed this about Christians, but we thank God for everything. I have listened to so many of you praying, prayer meetings and whatnot. I love The very first thing you do is give God thanks. That's so biblical. It's so right. A dad might put in a bunch of hours at work, pull a bunch of OT to put food on the table. Mom may slave all day long, keep the house clean, and to prepare a meal. And the first thing they do when they sit down to eat it is thank God for it. Because Christians know everything comes from God. The energy needed to work the job comes from God. The job itself comes from God. The economic system that made the job possible comes from God. The people who grew the crops and the animals that made the food come from God. Mom's ability to cook the food comes from God. Even the ability to digest and enjoy the food comes from God. And so, not to thank God for the things that He has done is to withhold credit that He deserves for doing what He did. And it is stealing. So, the Eighth Commandment is the taking of anything that belongs to another without their permission whether it's physical or non-physical. It also includes and requires of us to work for and to protect the personal property rights of another and to work for their financial well-being. That's the Eighth Commandment explained. Now let's take a few moments and consider why we break the Eighth Commandment. Why do we steal? Well, the answer to this is Again, found in the example that we have in Jacob. We break the Eighth Commandment for the same reason Jacob did. We don't believe that God will be faithful to His Word and provide to His people. Is your Bible still open? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it's page 968, the church Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Just one verse in this chapter, but it's a, such an important verse, considering the Eighth Commandment. This is verse 8. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, 
so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. We steal because we don't actually believe that's true. We don't actually believe that God will make all grace abound to us and that we will have all sufficiency for all things at all times. All, let that sink in. That's a promise that God will give you grace so that you will have all sufficiency in all things at all all times, so that you would abound in the work that God has given you to do. I don't know how God could be more clearer. He's telling you, I got this. Everything you need, everything to do what I've called you to do, to be who I've called you to to be, I've given it to you. All sufficiency, all things at all times. It's in me. I'll give it to you. You know what the context of chapter 9 is? Money. Giving. Somebody's like, I don't have the money to give. I could never give. God, God could never ask that much of me. All things. At all times. We steal. Because we don't actually believe that God will keep this promise. We're denying the Lord is a good provider. We're saying, this is what I want. I don't have it. I don't think God's going to give it to me, so I have to go around God in order to get it. Brothers and sisters, Christians have been believing that lie for a really long time. It goes all the way back to the garden, doesn't it? We steal because there's something we want. Something we don't have. Something we don't trust God will provide. We care more about ourselves and our well-being than we care about others. We fail to appreciate God's grace in other people's lives. We'd rather prosper even if it means they suffer. We steal credit from others because we don't actually trust God with our own reputation. Retaliation breaks the Eighth Commandment. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. We break the Eighth Commandment when we retaliate because we don't believe that God will actually be just. Instead, we believe that our sense of justice is better than His. And so we retaliate. When the cashier or the bank teller puts one too many 20s in your hand and you keep it, Keep it because you think that another $20 or so in our pocket is better than the job security of the person who accidentally put it there. So every form of stealing is an expression of unbelief. It's a functional denial in your heart that God will provide. And the worst possible thing that can happen to you when you steal is that you don't get caught. Proverbs 20, again, verse 17 this time. Bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward is, his mouth is full of gravel. In Proverbs chapter 9, Proverbs have a lot to say about the Ten Commandments. In Proverbs chapter 9, Lady Folly says, She's quoted, he's quoting Lady Folly who says, Stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. 
But the fool does not know that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. My non-Christian guests, I hope you've been listening today. I want you to know that the God of the universe who created all things has orchestrated a hundred million things which you would just have considered to be arbitrary and inconsequential to bring you to church today. He orchestrated them because he wanted you to know the seriousness of all the ways that you have broken this commandment in your life. He wanted your conscience to be wounded so that you would turn to His Son, Jesus Christ, to have your sins forgiven and your conscience healed. Friend, do not suppress the truth of the Eighth Commandment. You have broken this commandment. The Bible's word for that is sin. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Unless you turn from this sin and trust in Jesus Christ, you will spend an eternity apart from God under His judgment. Friend, we love you enough to tell you the truth about that. Before you leave this place today, find a Christian. Tell them you would like to have your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ. They'll pray with you. They'll begin meeting with you. And they'll show you how you, by the power of God the Holy Spirit, can walk out the Eighth Commandment. So what do we do with all this thieving and stealing in our own lives? Where do we go? Well, the obvious answer is that we go to Jesus. I don't think it's accidental that our Savior was killed between two thieves. So to keep the Eighth Commandment, we must go to the man in the middle cross and ask him what to do. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. Page 1014, if you're using a church Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1. As we see the, the Eighth Commandment fulfilled. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Christian, you don't have to steal like Jacob did what is already yours. You can trust that what God has done for you in Christ has secured for you an inheritance beyond your imagination kept in heaven for you. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. The Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, it hasn't even entered into the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love Him. Here's what this means. It means, Christian, that you have Christ, and Christ is, is everything. There is nothing you need that isn't already yours in Christ. And so you keep the Eighth Commandment by resting, by contenting your own soul in all that you have in Christ. Just for a moment, think about what and who this man, Jesus Christ, is a small sampling 
from the Bible in your lap. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the eternal Son of the living God. He is the one sent from heaven. He is the Word made flesh. He is true God from true God. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. He is eternal. He is immortal. He is unchanging. He is most holy and most wise and most free and most absolute and most loving and most gracious. And He is merciful. He is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He works all things according to the counsel of His will. All things in heaven and on earth are subject to Him, and He Himself is subject to no one. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. In Him we live and move and have our being. He is the shepherd of the sheep, the protector of his people. No one will snatch you out of his hand. He is the giver of eternal life, the blessed, the only sovereign, the faithful, the true, the almighty. He is the final and forever sacrifice for sin. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the bridegroom of the bride. He is the root of Jesse. He is the son of David. He is the bright morning star. He is the pleasure center of his father. He is the subject of the worship of the angels. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is Jesus the Christ. And so I must ask, what is it that you need that you don't already have in Him? All things are yours. And you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. And so every time that you are tempted this week to steal, remind your soul what you want. It's already yours. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ turns takers into givers, turns burglars into benefactors, pickpockets into providers. Rest in Christ. He is all that you need. Be content with what God has provided you. This week, work honestly. Work earnestly. Earn a good wage so that you might be able to share with someone in need. Because Christian, you are meant to be a conduit through which the kindness of God flows. Labor and do honest work so that you may have something to give. Be content with what you have. Be thankful for what you have. Be protective of what others have. And do what you can for their economic good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, the earth is yours and the fullness thereof. To you belong heaven and earth and all that is in it. And we humbly bow before you, acknowledging that in your wisdom you have granted to us a stewardship over some of the things that belong to you. And we confess, O Father, that we have broken the Eighth Commandment. We have sinned against you. We have stolen what does not belong to us. We've taken physical things without permission and non-physical things. We have withheld glory you deserve for what you have done, for what you are doing. Will you please forgive us? And Father, please look to your Son, whose sinless human life expired as he hung between two thieves. Account to him our sin and account to us his righteousness. 
And through this glorious transaction, may Jesus receive the praise for a people saved by grace, justified by a cross, who are spotless and blameless before him. Make this church a generous people with a true and right understanding about property, about the Eighth Commandment. And do this for Jesus' praise. Amen. Please stand to your feet for the assurance of pardon. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need.